probably the most important concept that we'll be talking about this semester is the localization of function in the brain. This is the theory that specific locations in the brain are associated with specific functions or behaviors in people and animals. So region X would be associated with function Y. Who came up with this theory of localization? Well, in fact, it was the early phrenologists. Franz Joseph Gall and Johann Spurzheim popularized this idea in the early 1800s. The phrenology head shows you specific human characteristics, personality traits, if you will. And the claim was that underneath the skull, there are those specific brain locations were responsible for those psychological traits. We have long known that phrenology is an example of pseudoscience, which is a system of theories and methods that appear to be scientific, but they're not. The claims and assumptions are not supported by scientific evidence. There's a link on the Canvas module detailing how phrenology, in fact, is a pseudoscience. How did the world rid itself of phrenology? Well, in part, it was due to the work of this man, Pierre Florence. He systematically ablated the brains of animals, birds usually, maybe some rabbits, and he observed how they behaved after the brain parts were removed. The word ablation refers to the surgical destruction of brain tissue or the removal of brain tissue. So his studies showed in his mind that once you take out various amounts of brain, sometimes even a lot, the animals, were, after they were sewn up, behaved normally. They would eat, they would drink, they would walk around. So he concluded that the phrenology's claim of localization could not be true. His alternative to localization of function theory was the aggregate field theory, in which he claimed that it takes all of the brain to carry out most animal functions. That's right. So Pierre Florence was right about phrenology. It was bunk, but he ended up being wrong about localization. Florence's view has not totally gone away. In the 20th century, Carl Lashley promoted the same idea, calling it the equipotentiality theory. It is true now that most people believe that there's strong evidence for localization. But where do we first start to see the evidence. The first convincing evidence of localization of function came from case studies, which are in-depth descriptive studies of people, groups, or phenomenon. They're exploratory in nature, and they cannot establish cause and effect relationships, but they can kick off an inquiry uh, for future research. You have likely heard about Phineas Gage, who in 1849 received a terrible injury to his skull. The case study about his injury was published in 1850. The case study established a possible relationship between damage to the frontal lobe and changes in personality. Later in the 1800s, case studies were published by Paul Broca and Carl Wernicke. Paul Broca was first, publishing in 1861, and Wernicke later in 1874. But they both were basically saying the same thing. Hey, look, I found something in the left hemisphere, a region associated with language processing. They found different regions and different types of language processing. Here we see the locations of Broca's area and Wernicke's area in the left hemisphere. Both Broca and Wernicke used post-mortem examination, also called autopsy, to identify the damaged brain regions in their patients and then come up with a hypothesis that it was damage to those areas that led to their behavioral deficits, to language in that case. Broca found that individuals who had damage to the left frontal region of the brain, had trouble producing speech, articulating speech, and also coming up with content words. 
Wernicke, on the other hand, found damage to further back in the brain, posterior area of the left hemisphere, led to nonsense speech and comprehension problems. Localization became the focus of the work of Corbinian Broadman, who in about 1905 published a claim that there were 52 distinct locations in the brain based on cell structure. So he looked at cells under the microscope in animal brains and human brains, and he said, look, there are 52 places where you can see the cell structure is different. Even today, in brain imaging research, about 44 of these Broadman areas are still used to refer to specific places in brain tissue. Now, Broadman proposed 52 in total, and you can see here that there are regions in the left hemisphere on the left side of the screen and the right hemisphere on the right side of the screen. And as we go through this semester, we will sometimes refer to some of these numbers, but you don't have to remember them all. I just want you to know there are these things called Broadman's areas, and they are locations in brain tissue. This image shows you the Broadman areas for Broca's area and Wernicke's area. For Broca's area, there are two Broadman areas, 45 and 44. But in the Wernicke's area, you have area 22 and a whole bunch of unassigned tissue that's nearby. So the Broadman areas do not neatly uh, segregate parts of the brain that we know are involved in specific functions. A fact that we'll be talking about again and again this semester is that individual regions of the brain that have been studied have been associated with multiple functions. So it is not the case that individual Broadman areas or individual areas that have names like Broca's area and Wernicke's area do just one thing. They are participating in multiple aspects of abilities. That's all for now.